sponsors as well. Um, starting out with um, Edge Wallet and they um, have offered us sort of a promotional deal in terms of like a three dollar equivalent in Bitcoin cash um, if any to onboard any of you who are interested in installing the wallet app on either iOS or Android and, and I say you know with all genuineness I think it is actually a great wallet. Um, Radar Relay is a decentralized exchange and I have this on a slide at the end, but they did request, um, understandably, that I read this blurb. So, um, so basically what Radar Relay is, is a wallet-to-wallet -wallet trading platform for Ethereum-based tokens built on the 0x protocol. Radar Relay operates an order book and relays orders between peers while never holding any assets in, co in custody, which is one of, these, one of the big deals like why decentralized exchanges are exciting. Um, you trade directly from your MetaMask or Ledger wallet. No depositing tokens needed. You can learn more about them at RadarRelay.com. And they are, they are one of the sort of big sort of uh, decentralized exchanges in, in the space right now. So, okay. So, I'm starting with Bitcoin Cash. Is, that's basically sort of um, what is going to be available for me to transfer to you at the end of the class. And also, for various reasons, like most people are familiar with Bitcoin already, but they aren't necessarily familiar with like why Bitcoin Cash is why Bitcoin Cash. Essentially, it's a fork, and this is going to be a very pretty low-level, like highly accelerated overview of what blockchain technology sort of is. And Bitcoin Cash is just basically faster than the original Bitcoin right now. Um, that's just like the simple answer. So the next question a lot of people have is, oh, I lost my connection with my phone. Hold on. Let's start again, okay. All right, so what is a blockchain? A lot of people have, you know, find this a challenge to sort of picture what this is. So one of the technical definitions is that a blockchain is a protocol for global value transfer. And that's a really, really important thing to realize. That term protocol is a really big deal because essentially what a protocol is, is a set of rules for data transmission, big. So blockchains are decentralized, you know, for the most part, meaning that no one has total control. Um, this is a really good thing for the security of the system because generally, like, whenever you have one person having total control over a system, it generally get, generally gets corrupted. We can see this, you know, in all manner of you know, you know, times in human history and whatnot. 
So this is the cool thing, another cool thing about blockchains. They're decentralized. Um, now, there are some instances, uh, you know, some exceptions to this. Uh, we're living in a world now where blockchain has finally become big enough that it's not just the public open source blockchains that exist now, like governments are starting to get in the game. So, you know, like now we have things like Venezuela, who is coming out with Petro, which is not a public or, you know, not like, you know, they control it, right? So anyway, so we're getting to, it's getting big enough now that governments are starting to get really interested, like large regulatory bodies are starting to get really interested. and. Just uh, so everyone knows, I'm definitely not a maximalist. Blockchains are not like characters in the Highlander movies in terms of there can be only one. Because there's a lot of people in the space, you know, who, yeah, you know, they, they think there just should be one blockchain to rule them all or whatever. And I, um, I tend to dis disagree with that because like we have like a lot of different protocols with a lot of different sort of technologies. And there are actually currently thousands of blockchains in existence. How much are they worth? Their value is determined by the market, and it's pretty much as simple as that. I'm not going to get into price too much, price history or, or any of that. So when we talk about like the word protocol, like protocol is a you know set of rules for data transmission. Like this is what this is the analogy I, I make to people in that I don't know how many of you like remember the early stage internet in terms of suddenly you're sitting in a computer and you see a, a piece of blue text and you click it, it takes you another web page and we were like, wow, you know, it's really exciting. Well, that's hypertext transfer protocol. It's HTTP. You use it on your web browsers every day, you use it on your phones every day, and it has completely revolutionized the way the world works. And you know, that's, that's the power of this stuff because it's not just, um, it's not just something that stays in stasis. Uh, it's also like you can upgrade protocols and the entire internet now runs on about 40 different protocols that you know are essentially like an application stack to make the whole thing work and this is another reason why multiple blockchains have their use because we can't expect, expect one blockchain to do absolutely everything that needs to be done um, for a healthy decentralized ecosystem. Okay so you know, I keep saying like it's a big deal, and a lot of my friends have been like listening to me like talk about this for a long time. But I'm gonna like uh, sort of like forward through uh, some stuff very quickly in terms of sort of like explaining to you on a sort of higher level what uh, what this is. Okay, so essentially when we when we talk about blockchains, we're referring to a uh, permanent, just distributed, and publicly viewable transaction ledger. Now that's a public open source blockchain. Okay, and for just purposes of brevity, uh, there's a lot of technical reasons why all of this is the case. But essentially, shutting down the network is impossible. Like when you have a large-scale blockchain like Bitcoin, you know when you have like uh, cryptocurrencies that have market capitalizations in like the billions, you know you're talking about something that's it's pretty tough to shut down. And that's by design. Um, the other another thing about blockchain is that counterfeiting or attacking is it, the systems are designed for that to be too expensive to be profitable. Uh, the network is global and decentralized, as we've already mentioned, and this is also key. Um, I'm talking about public open source blockchains. So it's open source software that's publicly available for inspection. And what that means is that you can, like Bitcoin's code, Ethereum's code, Bitcoin Cash's code, like they're posted on GitHub. So if you know how to code and you, you know, are interested in learning in the blockchain space, you can you know, download the code, you can run it on your own computer, you can analyze it, make sure there's no backdoor exploits, no vulnerabilities. Occasionally there are some, but for the most part, nobody's been able to hack these big systems yet. Now there's been some misnomers in terms of like what happened with Ethereum and the DAO, but essentially the DAO was a smart contract built on top of Ethereum that got hacked. Ethereum itself didn't get hacked. So there's a lot of, sometimes there's a lot of confusion about um, how all that actually works. Okay, so just moving very quickly here. Um, usually, uh, you know, I'm, I only have tw 20 minutes, so I'm moving as fast as I possibly can. So let's just dive in, talk about this pay the payment system, and talk about how that works. So this, this line at the top, long alphanumeric stream, or string, this is a Bitcoin cash address. Sign at the bottom here in bold, this is an ether address. Now, I don't expect anybody to walk around like out here and, and be able to identify the difference between the two. But what I am trying to sort of uh, eliminate is the intimidation factor that people have when they see this stuff. Because essentially, 
you can basically think of it like an email address. Like back when email is new, you know, people were like sort of confused. You know, it's like suddenly I have to use this at sign on my keyboard, you know, and they were like, what is it? Are we ever going to really use email? You know, actually at one time the internet was predicted to be a complete and total failure because nobody ever thought that anyone could be bothered to use email. So essentially what this means is this is like, this is a one way receipt of data. It's the same way some, like when somebody sends you an email. And the reason you can't, like nobody else can read your email is because they don't have the passwords to your inbox, right? Now, of course, like there's been hacks and stuff, but just for purposes of example, you know, that's what I'm trying to get at. So the difference here is that the password to this public address is what's called a private key. And What's going on with these blockchain systems is a lot of really fancy math. So what's happening with this uh, digital addressing system is something um, called elliptic curve digital signature algorithm. Yes, I think I just had that. I, mean, I think I got that right. But yeah, basically what that means is you cannot derive the private key from the public address, but you can um, derive. Oh, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Okay, so so basically the math goes one way. You, your private key is safe if all people have is this, but, and, but you can derive the public address from your private key here. And by the way, just for purposes um, of future criticism, this is technically a Bitcoin pri pri private key. And by the way, you don't want anybody knowing your private keys. This is not a private key I own. This is something I pulled off Wikipedia, you know, so there's, I'm just putting that out there too. So the map only goes one way, and that's one of the reasons like the addressing system is as powerful as it is. And also, it's worth mentioning that most blockchain systems are designed to have an infinite number of addresses that you can produce. It's quite insane. So best practice, you know, with most transactions now is to consider is to basically use one address to per transaction and just kind of like buried in your wallet under a lot of fancy code that most wallet software um, obfuscates from you to make the end user experience a lot better. And that takes us to Edge, which, as I've mentioned, really makes it a lot easier, you know, by hiding all of this complicated stuff like behind the scenes for you. You know, they, ha they have a password recovery function, which is really cool. They, st they start it with like a, you, a, what people are, how people are used to being onboarded onto an app in terms of like set up a login name, you set up a password, you set up some pass password recovery questions. And then like you're, you know, if you forget stuff, like they, they're able to trigger your, money, your, your memory about it. And they, they've made something that's very user friendly. But um, that being said, for the most part, when you're dealing with crypto, like the cardinal rule, just remember this always, like keep your passwords safe, write them down, not in a, you know, not in any sort of digital format. Don't take any photos on, they have to be on paper and it's best if they're backed up in different physical locations in case, you know, like your house goes on fire or something like that. But, um, but yeah, so basically passwords in crypto are with some, most wallets, essentially your money basically, like your money lives inside that, you know, the, the password that protects that set of private keys that's being hidden from you. So, you know, understandably, like some people are like intimidated by this because they kind of don't trust themselves. They, they worry about their memory, they worry about forgetting, you know, they worry about a lot of things. But this is the flip side of like having control of your money for the first time because, you know, I'm a big, you know, you know fan of the argument where that, we have this aspect of learned helplessness when it comes to dealing with our own money. Like most people have absolutely no idea of how little they control any of their financial assets that they have resting in any kind of institution, a bank, brokerage, whatever. You know, if there were a big run on a bank, we are the last people to get paid, like the last ones on the list. And you know, like this prevents all of that. You know, this prevents your account being frozen. This, you know, you don't engage in fractional reserve banking. Now, some of that is starting to come into play here is there are more and more like complicated financial instruments devised. Um, hopefully trying to avoid civil asset forfeiture, which is becoming a pretty serious problem in the United States and normal helplessness, you know, like this is seriously like get the, get the power back kind of situation. And so that's why I think it's so important. So I'm gonna blow through um, the Edge wallet uh, really quick. Uh, 
just sort of like letting you know, um, feel free to like download it, you know, as this presentation continues. Um, you know, it's available for iOS and Android, and it's easy to set up. And then at the end, if you're interested, I can give you like the three dollar three dollars equivalent in Bitcoin Cash. I'm just gonna um, make make a few things clear right now. So basically, you know, it's gonna trigger you. This is slightly outdated. It comes from from an earlier version of a, the similar of a similar software. But it, so it's gonna trigger you to like sort of set up a login, password, all that good stuff. And that's gonna take you here, and you have to really pay attention to this. Um, because Edge supports, it defaults to Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. And it's understandable that a lot of people get very confused by that. But I'm specifically going to send you Bitcoin Cash, which has the ticker sign of BCH. So when you, you know, go here and you, once you get all in and installed and stuff, there's going to be this thing called request here. It's going to pop up a QR code, which has like this address like embedded in it in a sort of a digital form. You will want, also want to give your, what, uh, your phone camera access for this. So, um, so yeah, you just want to make sure BCH, that's where you want it. So, you know, just because just if I were to send you Bitcoin Cash um, and you had your Bitcoin wallet up, they just disappear into thin air because that's the way blockchains work. You have to make sure that you're using the correct coin or token on the correct system. So um, I think I'm probably doing okay on time. Just give me like a, like a two minute warning or something if I need to wrap up really fast. But um, so just, Six okay. So basically, um, you know, I've talked about a little bit about the fancy math that really underpins this technology, you know, I mean, I don't know about you, but you know, I mean, I am aware of the fact that you know, on most American notes, uh, you know, most U.S. dollars, like in God we trust, is printed on them. I definitely trust the math that underpins this stuff a whole lot more than I trust the Federal Reserve or a whole lot of other systems. Because that's essentially what you're trusting. You're trusting um, some really complex cryptographic algorithms that, to date have worked and have worked very successfully. So as we continue to sort of visualize like what a blockchain is, like I find it helpful to also as this sort of like visualize this old accounting ledger from like the 1800s. And then every new page on this ledger is called a block. And everyone on the network is distributed a copy of the same ledger. If you run a full node, which is my understanding, which most of you are, nobody runs a, runs a full node on their phone. So, um, but just consider this is how like the network all like has the, the same data at the same time, the miners basically. So here's where we talk about mining. So mining is an absolutely critical part of how blockchains operate. And what it is, it does four really critical things at the same time. What it does, it's first a mathematical transaction clearing process that protects the blockchain against attack. Because this being the internet, everything is constantly being attacked and hacked all the time. So you have to constantly be on guard against that. It's also how new tokens are minted um, or coins. Um, there's a technical difference between coins and tokens. Most tokens are uh, referred to that are based on the Ethereum system, as, and the other ones are usually called coins, but it can it can depend just on the you know how the nomenclature is going to go. Um, so we currently have mining farms with supercomputer levels of power all over the world, with Bitcoin particularly in China, but really they're everywhere. They're in Canada, they're in the United States, they're in Europe, they're in South America, and that's what make this makes this a big deal because you know you can have a, chi a country like China just come in and ban crypto, but it's not going to stop the system. Uh, and that's what also makes this like super awesome. So one of the third things that mining does at the exact same time is it adds new blocks to the blockchain. So here's why you can trust all of this stuff that you can trust um, how the data is uh, re retains its integrity. Uh, because every new block verifies, uh, verifies the integrity of the previous block through a process called cryptographic proof of work. Now, this is mostly the case with coins like Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, still Ethereum. There are some you know, advances made in the space now. I don't think it's going to be cryptographic proof of work forever, forever but combined with cryptographic proof of work and the, uh, digital, the elliptic curve digital signature algorithm, these are the two main concepts of fancy math that's underpinning the system. And I don't have time to like, explain all that today. 
Um, but that's essentially what happened. So basically, what cryptographic proof of work is, is a mathematical game. Essentially, it is a lottery. That's basically what it's a, that's a simplified version of what it is. So it forces miners to compete against each other to protect the network from malicious actors. Because everyone's so busy trying to make money, essentially. Because the first miner to win the math game, which in Bitcoin's case is supposed to happen about every 10 minutes, in Ethereum's case, it happens a lot faster, um, like maybe two, like, or three. Oh, um, Siri somehow got triggered. I don't know how that happened. Decentralized <laughs> 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 But anyway, so. Um, about three minutes. So, OK, thank you. Um, so the whole point of incentivizing miners to clear these transactions and protect the blockchain is because at the end of the day, they get a block reward. So block reward is the same as minting new tokens. Uh, so right now, in terms of Ethereum, it's a little over three. I forgot to look up how much it is for Bitcoin Cash. For Bitcoin, it's currently about 12.5 Bitcoins, like is the current block reward, if I'm not mistaken. So this is what incentivizes everybody, you know, all these miners to participate in the system and add their computing power to the network. Because at this point, if you're going to mine on a large scale blockchain, you're requiring a lot of investment in really high end hardware. So um, essentially what that brings us to is this concept called distributed consensus. And this is sort of like the big takeaway term from like what blockchain technology is and what it does. Because at its heart, what, distri what distributed consensus does is decentralized trust, which is amazing. Like, you know, for millennia, we've had this huge issue with, you know, establishing trust between parties exchanging value, you know, because, well, you know, I mean, human nature is what it is. And we have to make sure that person A, who wants to send money to person B, they actually have the money. Um, and then it's verified the person B receives the proper amount that was agreed to on the other side. And for millennia, we've required these centralized institutions like banks or clearing houses or brokerages or governments to do all that for us. But now we don't have to, we don't have to rely on that anymore, you know, which makes it in many ways a superior system, not quite perfect yet, but lower fees for the most part, and also allows people a lot more financial freedom than they used to have. OK, so um, I get a lot of questions on this uh, about hacking and price volatility. So what I would venture to say here is that these large-scale large blockchains are actually fairly secure at this point. They're very difficult to take over just because of the sheer amount of money that you would just have to throw into a hole um, to stop them. And even, uh, even a state actor would find it difficult right now because of the amount of money they'd have to spend. And also the fact that we would probably be able to identify the specific hardware that they needed um, to do it. So I think that's pretty unlikely. Um, so what can get hacked is centralized exchanges, probably decentralized exchanges at some point in the future. Wallets, wallets can get hacked um, if you know you have got some malware running on your computer um, and it has keylogger, figures out your password or whatever. This is why hardware wallets are important. Um, I don't have time to go into that right now. By the way, you do not want to ever hold a huge amount of crypto on your phone. Just not a good idea. And then um, smart contracts can get hacked. Um, but for the most, most part, uh, the large scale blockchains are, are pretty secure. Um, another thing I would mention, volatility in a brand new asset class is to be expected. We see it all the time. It is exhausting if you've been around for a while, but you know I think we're still undergoing price discovery um, for, for most of the assets, even, even those in the top five and top 10. And that brings us to my last point in, in that all value is subjective. Things are only worth something because there's a collective agreement that they are, that's it. Um, you know, the market just thinks that Bitcoin is worth what it thinks it's worth today and what Bitcoin Cash is worth and what Ethereum is worth. And, you know, there's just this like also a collective hallucination going on when I take a $5 bill and like I go to Starbucks and get a tea or something. And, you know, they, they just accept it, even though there's no intrinsic value backing the United States dollar either. So um, I'm going to close with that. And I just wanted to show a slide from our like totally awesome sponsor who like really hooks us up with helping us with our site fee and all that. So. Um, that is my talk, and I guess it's time to move on to yes. a lightning talk. Yes. Yeah. He's going to talk. All right. So, a round of applause for Laura Lopez. Woo!
introduction to blockchain in 20 minutes is kind of near impossible, so well done to Laura. Um, we are going to have a few minutes for Daisy to set up. If you could scoot your chairs a little bit off to the side so we can fit a few more people in, get snacks and drinks, and you have about three minutes to set up. Hey there, uh, do you want me to mic you up? Do I need a mic? Yeah, yeah, because I'm recording the whole thing. Okay, yeah. Here, I tell you what, let me stop down, and then I'll come back. I will be... Oh, yeah, sure. No, no, I'll be, I'll be right back. Give me two seconds. Did that make sense? Hey, yeah, it was great. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. I heard you You're fantastic. four times, and that was the most clear I've heard of. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. I, very I'll, concise. I'll, I'll, I'll be right. I've tried very hard. We'll talk. Okay. We'll talk. I, I'll be right back. Yes. Th th thank you for coming, by the way. For a minute, yeah. It's good, good yeah, to see you. Yeah, yeah. Good to see you. Absolutely. Thanks so much for that. Okay. I got to hit my, fix my camera really fast. Sure, sure. How do you define large scale blockchain? Did you say that in the beginning? Uh, the, like the, the, the anything Big in the one, top five. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Excuse me. Okay. Yeah. All right. Still going. What's her name again? Laura. Laura. What Laura is she? Does she that, from um, the AI fintech? No, that's a different Laura. I think it's a different one. Yeah. Um, does Laura have a blockchain project or? Um, she does not have a specific one. No, she was just doing the intro. But she does teach, so she has like a online classes that she does. Oh, for blockchain. So, for blockchain stuff, yeah. Introduction. Okay, cool. Yeah. Awesome. Sounds good to me. Okay, I think we're going to get started with the next uh, piece. Thank you everyone for accommodating. Um, I thought we were going to get like 20 people, so we got a lot more, <laughs> so, which is fantastic. And it's lovely. Daisy, or D, I don't know what you're going by. Daisy. Daisy. I'm going to introduce Daisy, um, who's going to talk to us about blockchain for social justice. So okay. Welcome to Okay, hi everyone. Um, as Katarina mentioned, my name is Daisy Ozem, and I am the director of Blockchain for Social Justice. So um, a little bit of my background, because I'm not a developer, but I've studied this technology, and I know um, how it can be really used to either uplift our communities that are struggling or create more harm and disenfranchisement. Um, so I come from the public policy space. I worked for years in San Francisco doing like community development, um, social justice work, um, policy, all that good stuff. And then I started doing a lot of work um, in social enterprise, alternative economies in like 2013. Um, and that's when I actually learned about Bitcoin in 2013. So I'm not like one of these people that, oh, this is cute and new, let me run around in it. No, um, been studying it, been had skin in the game and, and been teaching our communities about this work. So I started Blockchain for Social Justice because I was really disappointed in what they were considering social impact leaders in the blockchain space. And a lot of it was really fanfare and to like build up accolades and all the other stuff. Um, and I knew that also our communities really need to know about this technology because we're going through so many different things that I know blockchain is not the end all be all, but it can support um, with some issues that we're facing in our communities, especially with the economic uh, piece and developing localized um, specific economies. So um, that's my little background today. And I also have a blockchain for public health uh, protocol that we are about to launch. So yeah, yes, I do have a blockchain project. So I am gonna really be talking about why do we need blockchain for social justice? Because I'm sure some folks, you were not trying to be here to listen to this, what I'm about to talk about, but it is important as you move forward so you can start to implement some of what you're gonna see um, in this presentation into the design and, and uh, implementation um, and evaluation of your projects. Okay, so what is social justice? Um, social justice is the just and equitable distribution of wealth, opportunities, and privileges within a society rooted in inequality. So we know that inequality exists. We know that there are people who are suffering more than others for really abysmal reasons. Um, and we need to make sure that we create solutions that really uplift those people because a lot of the technology I'm seeing right now is really just to um, create more comfort in, uh, in a first world, right? To really just automate and streamline different processes 
oh, I'm getting billions of dollars in investment and all I did was create an app that lets rich people get access to their food earlier. What is that doing for poor people? What is that doing for disenfranchised people, right? So um, I have this really good video and it kind of really summarizes what Okay, social justice is supposed to be about what we're facing. All right. And you don't got to worry about the sound, but let me see. That's the end. Any questions, comments, input? You saw what? You going? To <laughs> <laughs> um, why are you going to bed? So we're in trouble here, right? So that's why I honestly believe most of the blockchain solutions that should be in development should be addressing these critical issues. It's a really powerful technology, right? So I just wanted to show that to give folks some context in terms of what we're dealing with. Um,
right? So these are some of the things we're dealing with. We're dealing with the social service system that is on the brink of collapse, right? Um, we're dealing with really crazy income inequalities. This right here is a picture of um, a favela. It's basically a hood in Brazil after the World Cup, right, where they had torn down half of it to build these luxury apartments and condos or whatnot. Look how crazy that is, right? Mm -hmm. There's some of the issues we're facing, school to prison pi pipeline, people being incarcerated, all these different things. We just saw um, what's happening with the immigration crisis and kids now being brought into this hot mess, right? So we know that there's a lot of different things going on, which is why we really need to be smart about how we're moving forward and developing these different technologies. Um, so what are some of the ways that blockchain can help by creating impact and accelerating impact, right? So by creating different technologies, running our own different ICOs, I'm not saying it's the end all be all again, but we can raise the funds to fund our own projects that traditional philanthropy won't fund, right? Because um, philanthropy is a huge hindrance to really getting um, good projects up off the ground. Um, there's a refugee camp that runs on blockchain, right? Because we know that people lost their paperwork and forms of identification. And what it does is it actually scans your eye. And by scanning your eye, it can pull up all your facial recognition. Now, I have some issues with that, right? But what, what else can we do, right? Um, ICOs is a really great way people are funding their project. I know because of all the scams and everything, the um, SEC has jumped in, but it is still a way that you can uh, fund your project. It's like crowdfunding, right? but a little bit different. Um, and then also elections on the blockchain. We saw what just happened with our 2016 election, insanity, right? And there's an African country, they just ran their first election on the blockchain, right? Because you can't switch and change the results, you can't hack it, do all these different things. Right, it's a great way um, to make sure that we're keeping our elected officials accountable. So many other ways. There's a website called positiveblockchain.io. I encourage folks to look at that website. It has over 600 blockchain for good projects. So you can kind of start to get a layout of the land. Right? Um, and of course, the cryptocurrencies. And it's like I said, it is not an end all be all. But we see Bitcoin went from 30 cents to six thousand dollars as high as $17,000. And they said one day it will get to $100,000, right? If I can teach my community how to read white papers, right, how to sift out these different protocols and teach them how to properly invest, we really could end some generational poverty, right? And use those funds to reinvest in our communities to keep building more projects. Um, but what are some of the pitfalls, right, of blockchain? Because again, these are some of the things we're also trying to address with the social justice movement. Um, big data. I've seen a lot of different blockchains um, selling data. Um, just to give a plug, I saw one recently selling phenotype data for healthcare. And if anyone knows what a phenotype is, it basically, um, like your DNA type. So it could tell you, oh, based on this group of African-American phenotypes, these are the different illnesses. Based on Southeast Asian, these are different illnesses. And that just reminds me of the eugenics movement, right? And how they were doing all these different type of things using science, faulty science, to affirm why they were sterilizing black people and doing all these other crazy things. I encourage you to look at a movie called Maafa 21. It goes into detail. Um, financial exclusion, right? Because we know private keys and whatnot. I can lose that, right? And then I can never get it back again, right? And then we have some folks, people who are, they're still using Obama phones. They're not using all these fancy Androids and Apple iPhones to download these apps and do all these different things, right? And even the, um, the uh, software and the equipment for mining, right? Because mining, you can make a lot of money. That is still heck expensive. And who has the energy and the time I'm living in an apartment or a shared community, right? pg and probably gonna kick me out of my house. Um, streamlining the uh, acceleration of automation, right? Does everyone know what automation is? Where basically we're automating certain jobs that are inhabited by humans and using technology. And um, they, there's a conference recently and there, this man, he was like, yeah, you know, you don't want to be at work all day um, in your 40s and 50s. You want to go outside and have fun. That's why automation is awesome. And there were such huge gaps in cognitive processing. So, okay, I don't have a job now. Where am I going to get the money to live and eat, right? So we have to be careful because these are the people leading these different companies, and they don't have a really clear understanding of what's about to happen. Um, I wrote a really good article about that because uh, domestic violence, CPS cases, um, and, com and community uh, crime is directly connected to unemployment rates, right? Greed, we saw what just happened with all these ICOs, people losing millions of dollars, right? Um, and then also surveillance, right? So um, there is something going on, this was in The Economist, this is a really awesome blog, and it was talking about how China is using blockchain with AI to create a surveillance state, right? 
So they catalog people's faces. You're just walking around. You don't even know that this is happening. They log it on the blockchain, right? And now they're adding social meters onto it, like that one bad episode of Black Mirror, right? So we gotta be really careful because we see what we're dealing with right now with this presidency. They do not care, right? Okay. So these are some of the pitfalls too that we can um, that we should try to avoid uh, with our blockchain projects. Um, there's one more, and there's has anyone heard of Kairos? Kairos, okay. Well, we met the founder. He's a really nice guy, and he's a man of color, so I'm a little bit biased. But he started a blockchain project where um, instead of having a private key, it's facial recognition. That's her private key, and there's some good and bad to that. But it's open source, so anybody's blockchain project can use it, right? Um, again, there's a, it's a double-edged sword, right? So that, that's another thing I wanted to bring up here. So what are some components of blockchain? And I'm just gonna go a little bit on um, how we can use this to advance like, some of our solidarity movements. Um, hashing, I'm sure Laura talked about a lot of these different things. And I do wanna say that I really um, made it a mission to really simplify a lot of these definitions because I know some of us are not developers in here, right? I'm not a developer. It took me a long time to even wrap my head around some of these concepts. So hashing, um, these are how some of the private keys addresses are created, right? Just uses a lot of different math um, and algorithms for randomization. That can create systems where we are anonymous, right? Um, but then we have another problem, I lose my key and then that's it, right? Uh, nodes, they prevent bias on the blockchain by having um, a form of like a, how would I say, a node basically is um, a type of uh, mechanism that confirms transactions. So I don't need different people on the network to confirm, the node can handle it. But there's something that they have a master node. So you can have a master node, just think of Bank of America. If Bank of America was a master node, there's, it's just like a computer, a huge building with different computers and they're verifying all the transactions. Now think about automation, right? Exactly. Um, Consensus model, how governance and consensus, basically um, getting your transaction approved on the network is, gen is dictated. Um, and with consensus model, I think this is where some of the creativity comes in because every protocol, uh, every blockchain, every crypto has a different type of um, uh, consensus mechanism, right? So people are just getting more creative. Um, a fork is basically a change to the blockchain protocol. Um, and we see that Bitcoin had, has had a fork but what does this mean? Well, it means that if we come into the com certain community, Ethereum, blockchain, EOS community, and we're like, we don't like the way things are being done, the software is too expensive, etc., etc., it can create a fork, right? So now we have our own new blockchain community and it can just keep on forking. Um, mining is the approval of transactions on a network. I mean, this is where a lot of uh, people are making like funds. Um, the great thing about mining is that, uh, actually, let me talk about, let's be real, mining takes up a lot of energy, very energy intensive, right? So we need to think about that as we're talking about climate change and energy shortages, things like that, right? What can we do to reduce this impact? There's coins that are like self-mining. I think like one like NEO, self-mining coin. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and then smart contracts too. It's just basically a way to um, automate validate, um, verify, or enforce uh, certain mechanisms on a blockchain, right? But then again, think about automation, okay? And then what if there is um, an error in the smart contract, right? So these are just some of the like, technical components of blockchain that we could start thinking about. Okay, how, if I wanna build a project, we know that there's so much innovation that still has to happen. How can I focus on one of these different fields and build a project around that, right? To enhance the ecosystem. Um, so at Blockchain for Social Justice, I just want to talk about a little bit, that's a little bit about the work that we're doing. Um, we're having community gatherings. We just had a really dope conference. We had like the state treasurer, she was, she was there speaking, um, director of the Human Rights Commission for San Francisco, she was there. Um, we had the uh, head of Smart Cities for the United Nations Blockchain Council, he was there. Um, and we had like David Traup, he's like the executive producer of the Steve Jobs film, they were there really talking about the things that they're doing and they are very, um, innovative in their thinking and very not with that whole neoliberal like standpoints that I, I see a lot of in this space. Um, hosting community education events or partnering to do that. Um, have curriculums that we've developed, like teaching people how to just like, how to be, just know about blockchain. I don't know nothing about this. By the time I'm done with this, I'm gonna know some of these different things. Um, educational resources, working with other folks who've already done this stuff to just supplement what they're doing so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, just kind of being an umbrella for all those different projects. 
doing advocacy work, right? Making sure local government knows about blockchain, how they can create their own, right? And how they can improve policies so we don't keep on creating more um, uh, issues. Right now, I don't know if any, has anyone seen the split the California into three policies? Do you know who's like paid for a lot of that? Draper. Tim Draper, okay? And he is a crypto billionaire. Um, three generations of investors, their family, they know nothing about poverty. They know nothing about inequality, right? They have no idea what this is gonna cause. So I think it's really important for us who know about blockchain and whatnot to get in there because they're talking about, oh, blockchain is gonna help us run these three different states. Okay, right? Um, and then trainings, of course, as well, like going in and training uh, different community organizations, um, all kinds of folks on blockchain technology. So we have some really cool stuff coming up. Um, we're doing a statewide tour with Consensus, and I'm really excited, um, and some other things going on in the community because we really gotta make sure our folks are involved. I mean, this is the second largest transfer of wealth. The first was the slave trade, let's be honest, okay? Um, not only that, but just all that went on, colonialism, all of that, that was the first transfer of, transfer of wealth, and we saw how that went for our people. So we need to make sure that our folks are in this, okay? not just as consumers, because that's what they want, but as creators and owners. So um, I am done, and thank you. I know it's probably like, <sighs> took your head off. <laughs> Any questions, no? Yes. And the whole world is in on it. So anybody in China, Australia, whatever, can trade currencies, uh, different tokenized currencies, with us or you know anybody. Mm -hmm. And um, the more and more money funnels into, especially what do they call it, um, fixed tokens, like stable coins. Yeah, like yeah. or like Bitcoin has 21 million coins. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a finite amount of them. The more and more of the world's money goes into that currency uh, and the ticker price keeps going up, uh, the more and more it's worth. So the barrier to entry is knowledge. And, and for the communities that you want to serve, uh, exposing them to crypto and blockchain is very important. Yeah. And I would just say like one barrier for that is the economic trauma, mm -hmm. right? People are afraid, like, I don't want to lose everything. I already don't have nothing. Right? Right. So we have to talk about that too. Yeah. Right. Any other questions? Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, exactly, right? Um, I've seen texting blockchains where now you just text a number and you're in the network now. Right. Your private key is your phone number. Mm. Yeah, so much going on. There's so much room for, for building. Um, any other comments, questions? Do you want to talk about what, are you going to present later on? You? Yeah. Okay, cool. So I'm, I'm not going to put him on the spot, but um, he presented at our conference like doing something really amazing. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, a lot. Even though I understand the, the complexity with automation, a lot of this is fundamentally automation, right? It's, you know, it, instead of 20 people uh, in 20 different organizations updating a ledger, it's one central system updating a ledger in one place, uh, and those 20 people not doing it. That's yeah. fundamentally what this thing is, right? Um, so it is automation. Um, the, the, trick is coming up with automation that enables other kinds of work, I think, right? But, but at the core of this is uh, using automation so that we don't, we eliminate um, human error, error mm -hmm. and then maybe fraud, which, is, which kind of manipulates error and uses error to its advantage. Right, so I wanna say why I harked on the AI piece is because we live in a society run by sociopaths. 
They don't mm -hmm. care that people are gonna lose their jobs. I want you to go watch that movie, Sorry Not to Bother You, it was made in Oakland. <laughs> yes, okay? You need to go watch that movie and this is the mentality that they think with. They don't see us as human beings that need a salary and have lives and children. They see us as machines, as you need to, as an appendage of the machine and you need to work. And hey, guess what? I got my own family to feed, my prices are going up, there's tariffs, I gotta cut down my costs, so what am I gonna do? Automate, right? So that's what we're really trying to get people to look at because blockchain is creating automation, but is it 200,000 jobs versus 20? Right? It's like they put us in a hard, uh, between a rock and a hard place. Um, Della, I know you had a question. patents that people have created in the United States on a blockchain, and people can transparently access them with ease. Mm. Um, if he's mining uh, a token that contains a ledger that has like the copyright information for Lady Gaga or something like that, mm -hmm. right? And four or five people have to mine that same thing and then uh, with consensus go, yes, we're all not um, trying to uh, alter this block, right? It's legit put it out there, that's what keeps, that's what's powerful about that with artists and like their artwork and copyrights and stuff like that, right. putting it on the blockchain. Um, one of the ladies she was in Emotion Heap, she started a blockchain for that, mm -hmm. music rights. Um, and then there's something called ipwe.com and it's a blockchain for patents. So yeah, they're, they're doing everything. Yes. A basic question, you, in the start of your talk, you mentioned looking up, I think you said positive blockchains to see examples of real-world world, world examples right now of how there's positive impact from Yeah, um, just one project I really like, and I'm gonna wrap up. Mm -hmm. um, there's a blockchain project where they're using drones um, and the blockchain, and they go into different parts of, like, I guess rural Africa, Brazil, whatever, and they catalog different parts of land and put it on the blockchain and give it to the indigenous people, because mm -hmm. what ends up happening is these crazy corporations come in mm -hmm. and they, oh, I, we own the land. Right, and because these people have no idea about this crazy system that is up, um, they're like, wow, we have to get off our land. They even go so as far as causing wars and genocide to get people off the land. There's a really good book about this called um, uh, 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 Little B. That's like a narrative story, but there's another book called um, Dead Aid, um, and it talks about, no, yes, Dead Aid. I learned this in my African governance class about how certain parts of Africa, um, all of a sudden there's an AIDS epidemic, the land is cleared out, and then all of a sudden there's a mine for the natural resources there, right? So, yes. Um, he raised his hand, and I'm gonna get right to you. Um, I think one of my concerns about a lot of this discussion is that people are thinking big, where I think the real power of Bitcoin and these technologies in some ways is thinking small. Voluntary self-associations. I mean, we could literally create, say, an Oakland cryptocurrency where we basically um, you know, keep our money in Oakland. Mm -hmm. um, and there are other kinds of voluntary uh, associations that we can do. So it, <clears throat> I encourage you not just to think about social justice and all that kind of stuff. It's only from the world perspective. They're important. Yay, we need that work. But sometimes it needs to start at the, at the very small scale. Um, Eleanor Ostrom won the uh, economics award for uh, uh, writing about the commons, like how does commons form and work, says that you know, one of the things that she's observed in her research is that you really have to have this subsidiary where decisions are made local, okay, not by some um, redhead in, uh, in uh, uh, Washington, D.C., that they're made local and uh, finding the appropriate way to make things local. And these technologies can help with that too. Of course, and that's why at the very beginning of my talk I said localized and specific economies, right? So I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, do you want to? Um, to his point, what you just said, last year I invested in a Guap coin. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, Guap coin, they're an Ethereum blockchain technology mm -hmm. that focuses specifically about um, black and brown communities, grassroots organizations. Yes. And reinvesting those black and brown dollars back into 
no specific. So yes. it's already happening. Exactly. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so you know, um, yeah, we were just, um, me and Oli Inka here, she runs the Black Women's Blockchain Council. We were just in St. Kitts with um, Tavonia, the founder. Okay. Yeah, so she's doing something really powerful. Right. So if you just go on our website, you can see some of these blockchain projects that are doing some good work. Mm -hmm. um, we're just trying to make sure that we let everybody know about what's going on. Um, what's so your website again? Just B4SJ.com. Just be the letter B or B-E? Just be the letter B and then the number 4SJ.com. I mean, if you want to contact me, Katarina, you can give them my contact information. Yeah, I'll just write it up there. Yeah. Um, so, no more questions? All right, cool. Thank you so much. Thank you to Daisy and to Laura. And, um, you know, when I started learning about this uh, a few years ago, I realized that I needed to hear the same thing like seven different times before it actually sunk in. So, uh, and also they've gone sort of, you know, not too deep level on this. So I encourage you to continue your education in this. Uh, we have seven people who have signed up for the one minute lightning talk. They're just gonna spend one minute talking about whatever they'd like. First person is Johanna Tanner, or I think you're pronouncing your name wrong. Come on up. All right. <laughs> some of the problems of digital identity um, in our community. Uh, my offices are in Lafayette, uh, which we're getting ready to rent a new space there. I'm looking for other uh, blockchain and or uh, digital uh, technology entrepreneurs that might be interested in sharing the space uh, with me. I'm, um, yeah, this is good. Blockstream, create a blockchain to protect artists, right? Cetera, so and I mean, I'm like, I don't want to use your art. The blockchain to prove your art. I'm sorry. Thank you. 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 Thank it's an open platform that allows uh, ex it's, that allows experts in the community to build, uh, deliver, and verify accredited U.S. bachelor's degrees globally. So anyone can earn a full U.S. bachelor's degree from start to finish. Um, we are we have enrolled paying students from all over the world, from Canada, Mexico, China, Zambia, and more. Uh, we have a, where we currently offer a bachelor's degree in philosophy and an associate of arts. By the end of this year, we'll have bachelor's and master's in business and computer science and education. Our platform can host as many degrees as there are experts in the world who can create and verify them. Um, we are, our tokenomics is designed to incentivize uh, continuing, continual improvement in the quality 
and the accessibility of education. And uh, we offer a platform that allows anyone, the degrees we offer are $1,000. And, and that is part of our, we're mission driven. We want to make higher education, quality higher education available and accessible to the world. All right. <laughs>